probably um, it sort of runs in the family because my mother and father went on honeymoon on two motorcycles, so on two aerial red hunters. But in 1923, my mother had her first motorcycle. To see a girl in Luton bump starting a, a motorcycle and, and changing with hand change was quite incredible. So uh, she um, <clears throat> she sort of encouraged me and understood motorcycles, you know. And uh, well, when I was 16, I got my first road motorcycle, and uh, I was a bit crazy on the road, and I nearly hit a car head on, and I thought. That's not good, I was nearly dead. And I heard about motorcycle racing because I obviously read the motorcycle magazines. And I had a friend who was racing, a neighbor of mine, uh, who later on in the later years, we, um, we shared uh, uh, a Norton Dominator to win three consecutive uh, Thruxton 500 mile races. And uh, he told me about this first race at Mallory Park. This was the 13th of May, 1956. And then I changed my Veloset to a, a BSA and um, I entered this meeting and uh, rode my machine about 100 miles. My mother followed in the car with the tools and leathers in my tent and uh, we camped and uh, I raced, finished and uh, rode back home. And uh, so that started my first season. I, I then entered another six other meetings, rode backwards and forwards to the meetings without crashing, hopefully. And then I shared, the next year I shared a van with a friend and, uh, and it built up from that. Then I, in 1960, I won the Manx Grand Prix in the Isle of Man at record speed on a Manx Norton. And uh, because then, once you won the Manx Grand Prix, you didn't continue, you then progressed to the TT. So I went over there with, with two machines and, and uh, one mechanic and I won the junior TT and uh, actually on the last lap crashed in the senior when I was in third place so uh, I, was only, I was only about 21 then and uh, then I had invites to the Dutch TT and the Belgian Grand Prix and the Italian Grand Prix and, uh, uh, and then it, it sort of built up. I suppose when I first uh, came, well, I first rode in the, in the, uh, the, the X Factory Jaleras for Jeff Duke, and Mike Howard was my uh, competitor then. But then when <coughs> I rode for Factory Yamahas the next year in 64, when I first came to Amatra, it was Jim Redman, he was world champion. Uh, and um, so I had many, many battles with him. Um, Jim and I battled together, the Dutch TT, uh, I retired in the TT, that's right, I first did the Spanish Grand Prix, my first uh, uh, race in Spain in, in Montjuic Park in Barcelona, and I was third. And then I went to um, the French Grand Prix at uh, Clermont-Ferrand, and I won. So I joined the main team, I only had two mechanics with me, we joined the main team, in the Isle of Man, and I was then leading the World Championship. Incredible, my first, uh, first year. I retired in the TT after breaking, uh, being the first rider to lap it over 100 miles an hour. My machine stopped, we went to the Dutch TT, and Jim Rebben and I just battled, and he, he beat me by that much. <laughs> he was a bit, a bit hard, and the last corner he went under me, and I had to pick the machine up, and uh, I thought it was a bit dirty there. So, and then they went to the Belgian Grand Prix at Spa and uh, I passed Jim on the first lap going into the Master S and this is the long circuit and my machine seized. So I, uh, I finished that one. Anyway, it went on like this, the East German Grand Prix, the Czechoslovakian Grand Prix, which I won. I won the Ulster Grand Prix with Jim second. And uh, the, um, the last Grand Prix, which was a decider at, at Monza, um, all the team, all the Yamaha team had gone back to Japan. So I had to say, please, my one mechanic, one Japanese mechanic, and this is Yamaha's 
opportunity to win their first world championship. And they sent one mechanic, my number one mechanic, Seki Sun. So with two machines, we made a good one. And, and uh, but Honda had realized the problem and they made the six cylinder Honda the first time they'd, uh, that they'd raced it. And uh, Jim and I battled throughout the race and, uh, and then towards the end, I think the Honda slowed because it was a new machine, it was overheating a bit and the weather was hot. And, and uh, I won and won the world championship. So uh, it was quite incredible. But so I had my Citizen Safari, I had the two factory bikes in it. We went to the hotel, had a meal after washing and we drove them back to England. No, no TV, uh, <clears throat> no press conference, no TV interview, no real celebration. But until I got to Japan, of course, and they gave the whole of the factory a holiday and, and invited them to the, 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 the town centre where I had to talk to the Japanese, only in English. And, uh, and that night they gave me the choice of four geisha girls. <laughs> well, that was really good, yeah. So, yeah, and that was incredible um, to win Yamaha's first world championship and, uh, and my first. And it went on, I won again the next year, fighting with Jim, and then we developed the six-cylinder, sorry, the four-cylinder Yamaha to be competitive against the six-cylinder Honda, which was really, really fast. And uh, we struggled a bit for, for two years, and Mike Howard we, was then back with Honda after racing MB and um, and I retired a couple of times and was beaten once by my teammate Bill Ivey and I ended ended the season both seasons 66-67 uh, on equal points to Mike Howard but they counted that he had one more second place so uh, he um, he was given the championship so uh, I could have had 8, 9, 10 I could have had 11 world championships nearly as good as Agostini. But, um, but for Giacomo, um, <clears throat> really he had, he had the envy of the 350 and the 500 for five years and there was no competition. So it was easy for him, but he's a great rider though. He's one of the, one of the best and uh, really hard, but he did have it easy for those, those 10 world championships. <laughs> Take it easy. Make a lot of noise. Yep. I'm sorry in the corner. Make a lot of noise. You must not say, say, get on your slow. You must, you must go faster. Me? No, you must tell me. Go not fast. slow, because I'm already slow. You must <laughs> say, you must go a little. <laughs> no. You're fast enough, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'm the, there was, Jaleer had stopped, uh, MB had continued with Mike Howard um, after John Surtees and, um, and then with Giacomo they developed the three cylinder which was smaller, uh, lighter and more powerful and, and there was no other machines, only the, 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 the Koenig came uh, later and Benelli didn't really uh, produce a competitive, reliable machine. Um, then we had Air Mackie in the 350 um, against MV, but the two strokes then weren't uh, as uh, as fast. So um, during Giacomo's time, uh, there, there was no real, real competition, um, as, as I remember. Then I came to MV, of course, when the Japanese were getting much better, much more competitive. So, um, especially with the Yamaha TZ, the water-cooled twin cylinder, and they asked me to help Giacomo uh, to win the 350 championship. So, uh, I tried to get in the way of the Yamaha riders, Tepi Lanzavori and, uh, <laughs> and Yano, to, to slow them down to allow Giacomo to win, which he did. And then, of course, the next year, they, um, Yamaha brought out the 500, and uh, it, it was easier to, um, it had not so much power at first or acceleration, but it was easy to, 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 to corner for some reason. 
well, I know for some reason, because it, with the MV, when you go into a corner, you change down, you go in on, on with the throttle closed, and, and, the, and the front tends to judder, because we didn't have slipper clutches then, which um, now stops the jumping. Um, yeah, so it became hard. So when I joined MVs, we were up against it with the Japanese, with with with, with, uh, with Yamaha. So I, then I brought, um, I helped MV with development. I, I had special magnesium wheels made. I had some disc brakes made with drum brakes. And the Japanese were using disc brakes, which are better. And um, we fitted them, and I, because of that, I, I managed to stay on the rostrum for another couple of years. But um, but here at the last Grand Prix that Agostini won was here, right? On the Yamaha. Uh, I was on the MV. John, John Franco Bonera was my teammate. I was leading and John Franco was behind and, and Giacomo was five seconds behind. And with five laps to go, I'm going down the back straight. Mm -hmm. Some electrical problem, the condenser stopped. Anyway, Bonera went on and I thought, well, that's good because he can win. And he got the signal first, plus five seconds. And then he crashed and, and Giacomo won and, and cost me the world championship because then it was, it wasn't the gross points that counted. It was, you counted half the results plus one. So Giacomo could change a second place for a first place and uh, obviously got more points. And uh, yeah, that was tough. I was really angry about stopping here because we had uh, had the uh, the Yamaha beaten here. But um, no, Giacomo is one of the greatest riders and, and the safest riders to ride with. And of course, Yano, uh, fantastic also, but maybe a bit a bit um, a bit dangerous. <laughs> Yano was sorely, they were a totally focused team. And when Yano got the factory bikes, of course they were the best, better than anything else. And uh, when I was racing him on the MV, um, yeah, he was very, very focused and determined and rode to the maximum. Sometimes on the grass and sometimes off the walls. <laughs> and uh, he was desperate to win and uh, he rode over my limit anyway, or the limit of myself and, and the MV, 350 that is. And then he got the 500 the next year and uh, we, we, uh, we battled together on that. And we were both dicing at, uh, at Solitude, uh, so, uh, not Solitude, um, yeah, Solitude in Hockenheim, sorry. We weren't like changing places and, uh, um, yeah, well, he was um, very determined. I think the MV was a bit faster on the straights, but but the Yamaha of Yano was faster in the corners, so it was a bit like this um, because the the, 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 uh, the Yamaha was lighter, and so you could brake later. And uh, but the MV had more acceleration. But eventually, I won because his chain broke with me in the lead. And uh, yeah. Um, Perhaps in the early days when Yano was uh, riding the same machines, Yamaha machines as me, uh, we had some good dices, but uh, but I would beat him. I know in Modena and then at, at San Remo in Italy, we had a bit of a, a coming together and I had to shake my finger at him. Hey, Yano, slow down. Look, you know, this is not the World Championship. We're here just for fun. And uh, yeah, but then he developed, I think, and became more mature and uh, focused. Certainly when he got the factory Yamaha's, he was, uh, certainly on the 350, he was unbeatable. Yeah, not quite unbeatable, but incredibly, incredibly fast. And I think, I think that Yano, if, uh, if he hadn't been killed at Monza in, in 72, I, I think he might have won that, uh, the 500 World Championship because the Yamaha's were getting better and faster then. Well, it's incredible, isn't it? I mean, they have 20 engineers just working on the computer, on, on the on the engine mapping and the, the wheelie control, the traction control, and uh, it's like you could have monkeys ride them almost. <laughs> but 
you know, I feel that the, the skill has been taken away from the rider. The Reliant, well, certainly with Stoner, I mean, when he rode the Ducati, um, he'd, he'd dive into the corner and flatten the throttle and allow the, 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 the computer to, uh, and the traction control to, to drive him a maximum out. But that, that's not, that's not rider ability, that's um, computer ability. Yeah. So, um, although the, the riders are very brave, you know, they go into the corners now and the tyre development is so fantastic. They go deep into the corner, maximum braking, maximum. And, and as they turn, they keep the brakes on as they turn into the corner. Perhaps not Valentino on the Ducati because they have some problems with that, uh, that steering. But certainly the, the, the Honda and uh, the Stoner and, and Yamaha of uh, 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 Ben Spees and uh, Jorge Lorenzo is incredible. To go into maximum braking when you're turned in the corner is uh, quite incredible. That is bravery or confidence in the in the machine. Um, which, um, but I think a lot, they rely on the, the ability, the, the, the computer technology to, uh, to help them get the maximum from the machine. And I think because the crowd now is, is, is 50 metres back from the track, they've, they've lost so close contact with the crowd. Because, I mean, <clears throat> in my day in the Grand Prix, we had the Isle of Man, the, and the spectators could be as near as you, or near as you to, um, to, the, to the bikes as they psh, came past. Uh, the Ulster Grand Prix, the East German Grand Prix here as well, you know, the, the spectators were, were near by the edge of the, the circuit. They could feel the, the rush of wind and smell the machine and, you know, the Castrolar and... Um, but now that because of health and safety and perhaps because of the uh, demands of the riders, they have 50 metres run off and, and uh, so there's no chance of, of them getting seriously injured. And no, I think it's lost that, the real excitement. The Isle of Man is special. You know, it's 50 kilometres round, it goes from sea level to a thousand metres and uh, there are bumps and jumps and um, the road is bad and but also very fast as well. And you go up the mountain and uh, there's a bit of mist and some rain perhaps. Um, yeah, it, it's incredible. It's incredible. And you have to remember every corner or remember where the bumps are to, that controls the speed on the corners. But uh, just to finish, finish on the leaderboard um, or in silver replica time is it, quite a thrill. You think, wow, I'm alive. I remember one year in the 60s when I was leaving on the ferry with, uh, uh, watching the island disappear into the mist that Mike Howard came and he looked at the island disappearing and he said, Do you know, they should pull the plug out of that place and sink it because we felt very grateful to uh, to be alive when we left. <laughs>